Wondering what's next in your business or personal life? Welcome to Success to Significance, Life After Breaking Through Glass Ceilings, a podcast dedicated to helping you with all of life's challenges, discoveries, and opportunities. Whether you're seeking a new career, retirement, or simply wanting to make an impact in your community or the world, Join Jen Duplessis and her guests as they explore how to start, what to do when you're in the thick of a change or growth, and how to leave a mark in this world after breaking through your next achievement. You are moments away from the aha you've been seeking. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to this episode. I'm delighted to introduce our special guest today, uh, Mitzi Purdue, and yes, it's that Purdue, which we'll be talking about. Um, she likes nothing better than sharing her insider secrets of what made Frank Purdue a success, but we're going to talk more about her today, too. She doesn't know that yet. Um, <laughs> during her 17 year marriage, she was able to ask her husband real time in real time why he was making the decisions he did, which I do want to find out about today. And carefully recorded those attitudes that lead to, that led to his growing a father and son operation. Um, she now that it now employs over nineteen thousand people, which we probably want to talk about too, right? In agriculture and management, uh, in management, a former rice grower in California. I love, by the way, what I'm about ready to say here. She's the past president of a 35,000 mem- 35, member American Agro Women. Um, organization. It was the largest um, American farm women's organization, not farm men's. Uh, when Frank and Mitzi met back in 1988, they decided that chicken and rice go together. And I absolutely love that. That is so cool. And it's, you know, I'm sure that's how it, exactly how the two of you, um, you know, met. That's how, that's how it all worked together. So the first is so welcome to the show, Mitzi. And we've been talking in the green room for, for about a half an hour. <laughs> we've been having some fun. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And I feel as if I'm talking with a soulmate because everything that you say, I endorse. So oh. we're, we're not going to quarrel in this session. <laughs> No, no, certainly that's not the intent. That is definitely not the intent. So, so one of the things I want to ask you, I just want to kind of go back and, and um, I'm going to ask you quite a few questions, but, you know, take us back to uh, your childhood because you, um, you know, it, were in rice. So were you in rice with your family? Did you get into rice separately? Did they do something different? Did, you know, what perpet- just tell us a little bit about that part first. Okay, I'd, I'd love to. And no, I did not grow up on a rice farm. My father and my uncles were co-founders of the Sheraton Hotel chain. Uh, and this was in Boston, Massachusetts, as opposed to California, where I grew rice. But I grew up as a hotel heiress. I got to see how my father and my relatives built a company from no employees to 20,000 at the time of my father's death. And we did sell the Sheraton Hotel chain, but uh, I think rice farming might be as far away as conceivably possible for somebody growing up in the hospitality industry. Oh yeah, I imagine. So, 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 you know, tell us a little bit about your childhood then, you know, we'll get to the the rice farm as well, because I'm sure that's where this is somehow how you met, how you met Frank, but um, you know, growing up in that privilege and that, in that type of thing, tell us about the parenting that you received versus the type of parenting that you, you know, subsequently gave to your children. Okay, I, in fact, I tried very hard to imitate what my parents did because I was really happy with their approach. They were very strict. They're, I mean, I think my mother's maybe, oh, I think I'm exaggerating when I say this, but I think one of her biggest goals was not to have spoiled children. Yeah. Because it's so yeah. easy if you grew up with wealth and privilege to, uh, to be monsters. Yes. And, and uh, my father moved his family to the country, to Lincoln, Massachusetts. Uh, I know so I grew up in a farm. Yeah. Uh, and the reason why he, why he moved is he wanted his children to have farm values. You know, I, I have, I've certainly mucked out a great many barns in my life. Um, my first chore was, was with chickens. Yeah, it's funny, given who I met, later married, but uh, with chickens, if they're, when they've laid eggs and it's, it's in a chicken house, you reach under their breasts and you pull out an egg. And yeah. that was the first, tra- and it was during World War II. And that, that was my chore. Mm-hmm. And uh, when, whenever I wanted something, 
my father's just automatic reflex answer was earn it. And, mm -hmm. and my, my siblings and I, to this day, we go economy class rather than, uh, than first class. Uh, we use subways and buses. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were taught, you know, mother emphasized this so much, but my father certainly went along with it, that you don't get your identity from spending money get your money, you get your identity from service to others. Yeah. Oh, that's really critical. And I, you know that I grew up with that too. I mean, work ethic, we actually call it the, the curse <laughs> because we're such workaholics, you know, we are, we, we just love working. And, um, you know, as you and I were just talking about my eldest grand, um, uncle at this particular time, you know, and the family is 87 years old. He still works. I mean, it's, it's what he loves to do. And, uh, you know, and I think that that that's super important for values. And I think that goes, you know, through your, your whole life. And so now were your, was your maiden name Sheridan? Was that? No, no, how, there's a story of how, how Sheridan got its name. But, you know, this is an additional sort of example of how my parents tried very hard to have children who, I mean, I can't say that they succeeded, but I can promise you that they tried not to have spoiled children, but kind of an example of father's attitude in, in the Great Depression, nobody was buying hotels so that, you know, there were just a lot of them in the market. And uh, when he bought his first hotel, he was able to make enough of a success of it that he had money to buy a second. By the time he got the third hotel, and they weren't Sheraton hotels at this point, the third hotel had a great big top of the roof, $10,000 neon sign saying that the name of the hotel was Sheraton. Huh. Who father, as a good New England Yankee, couldn't bear to tear down a ten thousand right. dollar uh, <laughs> state of the art sign. Right. Right. But you want to have the same name for all the hotels because it's easier to advertise. Yeah, you know, three hotels with one name. Right. And yeah, you know, he could have he could have decided that they would be called Henderson, but he had two reasons. Well, he had several reasons not to do it. The first one was he had enough uh, modesty to realize that Henderson is not, doesn't have a ring to it. Mm -hmm. Sheraton has, you know, it sounds good, Sheraton. Right. Uh, yeah. And I loved it that he was, he was modest enough that he didn't have to have his name on his company. Yeah. Cool. That's, I and, think and, and I, I would love to share something else from my childhood since you were kind enough to ask. Yeah. I have an absolute vivid memory of father one day and I might've been 12 years old and I wander into his study, it's a weekend. And you know, he's got all these books around him, uh, like ledgers and accounting stuff. And uh, you know, he's going through it and studying really hard. And little me asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm giving money away. You know, he, was, he was going through requests from, uh, from charities Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little and I don't understand this. So I asked him, well, why are you doing that? And his answer was, the greatest pleasure my money ever gave me was in giving it away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that, that is so what we were brought up with, that we were here for service uh, and that we get our identity by by serving, not by spending. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, as we look at, you know, currently in the, in the world, we have five generations in the workforce, five generations, the last generation, Gen Z just, just got in the workforce. They're 25, right? The eldest of them are 25. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because what the values that everyone has, you know, about that are, are very interesting. Um, you know, and uh, I find that there's a lot of community in the younger generation. They want to be part of the community. They want to be, they want to make sure that the company is giving to the community, but it's, it's a different approach to how it's given, you know, in the, in the baby boomers and the silent generation, you know, or even the builders, whatever you want to call that generation, they, um, they gave money and the younger generations are giving time. I'm finding there's a, you know, but still at the same focus, but a different way of, you know, of giving. And um, so, yeah, that's a great, that's a great story. And it's, it's, um, you know, it's wonderful to hear that from someone who, you know, now, I mean, the Sheridans are everywhere, right? And <laughs> different versions of them. And, 
and all of that. Um, okay. So let's, so, you know, you grew up on a farm, which by the way, I, I told you, I live on 21 acres. There's something about being able to, and not that I have a farm, I'm not out working it, but most people don't know that you dig up potatoes, <laughs> little things in life, right? <laughs> um, is that where potatoes come from? You dig them out of the ground. Yeah. That's where they come from. Um, but well, you, you know, you it's a, pick a potato off, a tree? off the tree. <laughs> I don't know where people think, I mean, we've taken people to our local farm and, uh, you know, and they're like, oh, I never knew that you actually dug them out of the ground. I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, and so those kinds of things are just neat. You know, you have more, more, uh, respect for everything, you know, everything that you consume, but, um, so, you know, so later on, I, you know, so you grew up and, and you went to California and you, so did you start this rice farm? Did you just work at a company? Were you in sales? What, what kind of happened there? Well, my father died when I was, I was 27 years old and so, you know, he, he died suddenly at age 70, he had a heart attack and it was totally unexpected. And suddenly I have, and we sold the company and there were 400 hotels and it was family owned. So suddenly I've come into a great big inheritance. Yeah. But none of my siblings, there were five of us, none of them just went out and bought, you know, fur coats and racehorses or yeah. airplanes or yachts or whatever. No, every one of us in one way or another invested it because we had been taught that we're stewards, you know, that it's, mm -hmm. it's not a good thing just to go spend all the money. Right. And I was living in California at the time that I got this inheritance. And I decided I wanted to, you know, I could have just put it in the stock market, but it seemed to me a lot more interesting and maybe even a lot more fun to invest it in agricultural land because, yeah. well, I guess, you know, roots that go way back to my, to my childhood growing up in a farm. And so I spent four years before buying any, any agricultural land, but I spent that four years taking courses at the local university, uh, agricultural accounting, rural appraisal, agronomy, just all sorts of things that would prepare me uh, to, to make this investment. And then when I invested in the first piece of agricultural land and it, it happened to be rice, um, mm -hmm. I bet I looked at 30 farms before I bought the first one. So I put, you know, I didn't just plunk down money. I I really, really researched it as if I was writing a doctoral dissertation. Right, and right. It, it paid off sure. incredibly because my inheritance, part of it was uh, in a trust in a bank. And then part of it was what I could control. Yeah. And I was calculating recently that what I've done with the money that I inherited, I increased it 600 times versus yeah. what the bank did, which might have been I don't know, five times. Right, right. Four. And, and so I'm, I'm a huge believer in putting the work and the skill and the knowledge to, to research your investments. But I think that you will do better. Oh, I don't know if I mean that. You, the odds of you're doing well, if you put the effort in yourself. Right, um, right. I think, it's a, I, I think it's a good strategy, but only if you're willing to do a lot of research and listen to a lot of advice. Yeah. Well, in counsel, right? Not opinion, right? Yeah. Counsel from experts, because that there's a big difference there. You know, what are you doing doing a rice farm? Are you crazy? Versus let me show you how you can make this happen, you know? Well, I, I, I developed a theory that you almost know what advice you're going to get before you get it, depending on who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so yeah. I, among the people that I asked for advice from most were yeah, I made it my business to get to know a whole lot of farmers and I loved them. So it worked out. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I suppose if I had asked a, a Wall Street broker, is this a good thing? They, they might have said no. But a farmer who's who's doing it can can really give me good advice. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So so you had, you know, your your rice farm and you had some other investments. How did you meet Frank? OK, but. I, I had probably a dozen rice farms by the time I met him because I had, let's see, I began okay. investing yeah. in 74 and I met Frank in 1988. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And you asked me to tell what it was like meeting him? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we met at How a did you meet him? Yeah, how and what was it like? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he was the love of my life. 
Uh, well, now, was he Purdue Farms? I mean, you know, as we know him, Mr. Purdue, was he was he that at that point or was he uh, sort of like Kentucky Fried Chicken? You know, Colonel Sanders, he was out trying to make it happen. Where was he in his process when you met him? Well, he, he was second generation. He was born in, in 1920 mm-hmm. and he started out with his father and they were one of like 5,000 chicken growers on the Delmarva Peninsula, which is part of, it's part of Maryland and part of uh, Delaware. And it's also a little bit of Virginia. There were 5,000 growers. And yet by the time of Frank's death, he was like the top in the top three chicken producers in the country. Yeah. Uh, And he started out with no employees. And Mm -hmm. it's a story quite similar to my father's. But yeah. he employed 20,000 people at the time of his death. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you, you asked about where he was in this journey. As, as far as I can tell, it was, well, when I met him, he employed 16,000 at the time. Oh, yeah. Of so death. he was, yeah, he was starting to get yeah, So he was, he, was, he was already famous. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, so you knew him then. So when you met no, him, you actually, like, I didn't. Oh, really? I was thinking you would say, you know, you're Mr. Purdue. You're, I love your chicken, right? I, I wasn't sure if that's where that all came from or not, but you didn't even know him. So that's good. No, because I was living in the East Coast and back in 1988. Yeah. Uh, we didn't sell chicken or he didn't sell chickens on, on, the, on the West Coast. So uh, yeah. it, it was a party. And I'm going to guess there are 80 or 90 people there. And I saw yeah. this guy. And I could tell that he was famous because everybody was crowding around him. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't have a clue who he, who he was. Yeah. Uh, but, and there, there was like a line of people to meet him. And in general, I never line up to meet celebrities because it doesn't mean anything to them. And, you know, right, right. That's funny what. you say that. Yeah, I'm kind of like that too. I see it because I speak with a lot of celebrities, but, I, and I know them, but I kind of stand off and just let everybody else go gaga because I know I'm going to have my moment backstage. All right. Well, I didn't <laughs> even know I'd have my moment, but on the yeah. other hand, he was so attractive that possibly for the first time in my life, I actually wanted to shake the hand of a celebrity. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, when when the line reached me, uh, we started talking. He was very interested that I was a rice farmer. Yeah, and uh, and that I was angle. divorced. He was divorced, yeah. and the first five minutes of that conversation were. And um, by the way, I don't know. I don't even remember what happened to the other people in line. But we, the, our first five minutes, were talking about how we had both been divorced that neither of us would consider the possibility of the notion of the concept of remarriage because we thought that marriage was an institution that made people miserable. And and then somewhere around five minutes into the conversation, which we were just enthusiastically agreeing that would never remarry, (laughs) uh, we also started agreeing that, you know, that was unfortunate because it meant growing old alone, but we didn't have a choice because we'd never trust anybody again. And then- He looked down at me and he said, I believe I could trust you. Wow. I looked up at him and yeah. you know, he's that gave got me a goosey. really trustworthy face. And I said, yeah, they I gave me I goosebumps. Yeah. And so well, we now that's interesting. Um, you said look down at you. How tall was Frank? Because was, from the commercials, he looks like a short guy. Uh, over six feet. Wow. I'm yeah. five, six. And so it was definitely looking down. Oh, yeah. Me. No, definitely. Definitely. What's your but fondest what, memory of Frank? Oh, wow. Uh, Frank was a very romantic person. And every Valentine's, you know, he's a captain of his industry and just totally busy. But he would go to the florist himself and get two dozen roses and then write uh, in French a love note. And, oh, wow. And he, Is that cool? I mean, yeah. because, you know, I know that he could have had his secretary do that. But no, he did it because... He was aware that the extra effort it took to do that makes the gift, you know, a hundred times better. Yeah, that much better. Did um did does he speak did he speak French? Did you speak French or did you he just knew that one phrase and you would have to translate it? <laughs> figure it out. Well, um, huh. I think that he learned it in high school. I, huh. In my case, my parents sent me um, to a school in France for about half a year. Yeah. Uh, but but he you know he had a very retentive memory and I think whatever he studied he kept it in his mind. Yeah, yeah, and it sounds like you know he was. It's a 
you know, as I was reading about him doing some research, you know, for this podcast and everything, um, it's so unfortunate that he wasn't born just a little bit earlier because I could see him sitting around the campfire with Ford and Vanderbilt, just hanging around and masterminding together. Oh, you, you would have been great at that. Yeah. Wouldn't that, I, I think so too. I, I just, I get the impression that, uh, you know, that, 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 that is, you know, the case. Um, I wanted to kind of switch gears with you as we kind of wrap up our time together. Um, and so now I know why you're, why you live where you live. Uh, <laughs> that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, why do you, you know, and I don't ever say where people live, but, um, and, uh, uh, but the question, the question I have for you, I just want to, I do want to switch gears because I know that there's something that's really important to your heart, you know, just as your father had said, uh, you know, is giving back to charity and, and working, um, with people less fortunate. And, you know, and I think that that's important in all of our lives to, to find something that we're passionate about that we can help other people with. Um, and in doing that, whether you have money or whether it's a volunteer, you're always growing and you, you uh, gain wealth from that, right? And wisdom from that in, in your heart. Um, so I know that you work a lot with combating human trafficking. And, you know, as we're recording this video, this uh, episode yesterday was national, um, I don't think I should call it National Human Trafficking Day, but National Fight Human Awareness. Trafficking. That National awareness. Human Trafficking Awareness Day. Yeah, awareness. But it is yeah. Trafficking Awareness Month. You know, I know one of the things that you've been working on uh, and working with is uh, human trafficking awareness. And, you know, ironically, yesterday was the Awareness Day, but I know the whole month is dedicated to human traffic awareness. So tell us about that. Tell us um, how you got into this, where this passion kind of came from, and and give us some awareness today so that we we can share this with the rest of the world as well. Okay, I'd, I'd be very happy to. And I will, I will tell you that up until two o'clock of April 11th of 2019, the words human trafficking just didn't mean anything to me. I mean, you could hear them, but it didn't resonate. I didn't, didn't mean anything yeah, to me. Yeah, it was someone else's problem. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't even quite pay attention enough to know what it was, how big the problem was, yeah. or, but, but here's what happened that changed everything for me. I heard a lecture by a guy named Paul Hutchinson and Paul Hutchinson, his specialty is uh, rescuing trafficked kids. And he showed a video at a, it, it was a, a business leaders conference that I have to be giving a talk at. And he spoke after me and he showed videos of children who were just about to be rescued. Uh, and I saw things that I couldn't unsee. Say there's maybe 10 kids, maybe they're, I don't know, around 12 years old, they're little girls. And just the, the sight of the absolute fear and terror on the faces of these little girls, because they, they were brought together, they thought to be part of an orgy. These oh, were little right. girls, yeah, little girls who- Wouldn't had, even know what that word means. They wouldn't know, but they'd experienced it. Yeah. Because uh, very typically they would have been forced to have sex with strangers 10 to 20 times a night. You know, little girls, 10, 12, 14. And when, when I saw their faces, and they did get rescued, so it has a happy ending. But good Lord. I mean, even one, one adult raped one time, it stays with them for life. Yeah, what must tattoo. it be like to have it happen every night 10 to 12 times, 10 to 20 times a night, 365 yeah. days a year. Yeah. And, and then I learned further something that is just, I mean, it's, it's too aw awful to grasp, but I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'll say it briefly. The life ex expectancy of a 12 year old child who is being sex trafficked is seven years. Yeah. They will probably be dead within seven years and it's going to be suicide, overdose, disease or murder for organ harvesting. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, do you find, cause I, I watched something about this um, some time ago and I have a lot of friends, you know, in, in the sort of the circles that you and I, I talk to, right. That we work with and, and our colleagues, but um, you know, and I, I got introduced to the, 
just how bad this was. And um, I was watching something about this and they're actually, if I'm not mistaken, and I want you to correct me because you've done much more research and much more involved. I don't want to speak out of turn, um, but actual, um, uh, um, how, I don't know how do you, how you say this, uh, you know, how a, a fish, fish are grown in a, in a vat. Sure. Sure. Farm. <laughs> I, I want to call it a farm, like a fish farm. Fish farm, yeah, absolutely. And I, I've heard that there are children that are, uh, women are impregnated and sell their children for money, sell that child for money, and they they just raise that child until they're the, at the age that they can put them into this environment. And that's where I wanted to stop things. It's just like stop, start it, stop it where it starts. Um, have you heard uh, what you're that? describing does happen. In fact, the, yeah. you know, human trafficking is very complex. The, the number of ways that this evil can express itself is just absolutely breathtaking. I was horrible beyond imagination. Yeah. And the effort that I'm involved with is it's something somewhat new. And that is, well, I have to tell a little side story. It takes about mm, maybe 90 seconds, but 15 years ago or more, one of the larger software companies was having a terrible problem that in a way, th there's a connection with its problem in human trafficking. Hmm. Its problem was that counterfeiters or pirates, people were stealing like a $200 program and you know, it cost them nine cents to buy one of these discs to replicate it. Right. They, co they could put individual pirates or counterfeiters in jail but it was so lucrative that the moment they put somebody in jail, somebody else would take their place. Right. It, it was utter whack-a-mole, which frankly is a lot of like what goes on with human trafficking. Yeah. So that, that's what the parallel it was. But today the software company has, how about effectively doesn't have a problem with piracy. Right. And, and the reason why is because there's a group of just super experts in uh, following money. You know, right. whether it's using the dark web or artificial intelligence or whatever, they can track the pirate or the uh, counterfeiters. They can track the money flow until they get to their bank account. And then they freeze the bank account. And the banks always cooperate with this because the banks right, don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it can mean fines or horrible yeah. reputation. So the banks pretty much always cooperate. And the end result was that this software company stopped having a problem with, with pirates because that you they had taken away the economic incentive. If you're not going to make money because your bank account's going to be frozen and returned to the software company, yeah. it, it, it effectively it ended the problem. Well, what if then we could- They applied things? that to, yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. Or yeah. Actually, it would require a lot of fine tuning. But what if we could get the- the human traffickers who are making $150 billion out of this atrocity, what if we could get, what if we could freeze their bank accounts? Yeah. But there are people who are able to do this, but they can't work for free because, you know, very typically they may be making a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. Because they've got these extraordinary skills and they've got mortgages and kids to put through college and one thing or another. So they can't do it as a volunteer we have to find money to pay them. But imagine if we could do for human trafficking, the kind of thing that was done for yeah. software piracy. Yeah, to stop it. You know, and I think it comes in many forms. It's not just children, you know, it's adults too. I mean, there is all kinds of trafficking going on. And, you know, the statistics in comparison to, and not to um, uh, diminish or, or say anything you know, that it wasn't horrible, but of all the slavery that was in the United States, that this is, you know, some multitude of X, right? Whether it's 5X, 12X. Actually, I can even give you a statistic. Yeah. And again, this is not in any way to minimize the horror of slavery. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, there are statistics that say the North Atlantic slave trade was... 15 million people right. from the 1600s until, until it stopped. We're at 40 million. Yeah. So 
You know, anybody who considers slavery horrible a century and a half ago, pay We're attention experiencing to what's going it on now. right now. I mean, yeah. if, if you would have been an abolitionist back then, you should be an abolitionist right yeah. now. Yeah, and I understand there's some undergrounds, there's some railroads for this, there are, you know, quite a few things for this. And, uh, you know, and it's sad because it's right in our backyard. And I mean, it's no different than, it, I'm not human trafficking, but it's no different, you know, for example, where I live, I live in the wealthiest county in the United States. Really? Yep. And we have over 28,000 homeless children. And they are absolutely prime targets for traffickers. The absolutely. Traffickers, yeah, absolutely. they're prime vulnerable. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you think about a county that has so much wealth and so much, you know, money flowing in it, um, that you, you would. You would think that no one would be homeless. Everybody should be okay. But we have 28,000 homeless children. And it's growing right now. And it's growing with the women as well because of COVID. Um, it's growing because we have um, we have an organization called Laws, which is the Loudon Abused Women's Shelter, and it it can't accept any more people. There's no more people to accept. No more women with their children. So they are now you know trying to figure out where they're going to live or be homeless, live in cars. Um, yeah, and there's a big you know, and I mean this push has been around for a while for Laws. Um, and for the homeless children in our area, but it's gotten bigger and bigger because now it is prime picking for these human traffickers. I talked with a woman, she looks at trafficking from a global point of view. And she said, because of COVID-19, and I'm repeating statistics, I can't know that they're true, but I tend to trust her because she studies this. She said that COVID-19 has pushed a billion additional people into actual yep. poverty. I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, po poverty, I think, is defined by the United Nations, and I forget what the cutoff is, but yeah, yeah, whatever it is, I mean, I think it's something under two dollars a day, but I, I don't know what the exact figure yeah. is. But yeah, a, and, a billion and, people yeah. who were not in abject poverty now are, and yeah. it's the poor that are most vulnerable to traffickers. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what what can we do, the listeners? What could the listeners do? And and I'll be happy to put a link in and you know, into our show notes and things, but what can we do to um, help the, the organization that you're involved with? Um, and maybe it's the global organization, but you know, what can we do to help? Um, to help? Can we donate? Um, is there a place to donate or is it just information you'd like to get out there and increase that awareness since it is um, Human Trafficking Awareness Month? Okay, well, first of all, I love the question and thank you. and. Uh, Second part of my answer is all of the above. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, but there is an easy way. And what I'm about to describe, we have in the neighborhood of 500 volunteers. And frankly, I'd like 10,000 volunteers. Uh, I wish, yep, get out your smartphone or pencil and paper or something to write down because I'm going to give you a number to text WTF, which stands for win this fight, but it also stands for something else that we uh -huh. all know. Yeah. Well, but, and, and you know what? That's how I feel when I think about this. So that's okay. No, so, I mean, it's not an accident that I would yeah. like you to text WTF to 51555. Okay. And, and here, here's what happens when you do that. Or number one, here's an easy way to participate. And, you know, bunches of people have been doing this. I bet you won't easily guess what this is, but I'll no. tell you what it is. Rosie the Riveter. Oh, Rosie. I was going, okay, wait a minute. Is this, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, Rosie the Riveter is sort of the, like, you know, like win this fight. Yeah. Yeah. Except, uh, this is kind of paying tribute to Rosie the Riveter. She was 75 yeah. years ago. This is a 21st uh, century version of it because uh, Rosie the Riveter, she, she had, she encouraged women to go out and, and, and work in the factories and make it possible for world to, the, to how about to, to destroy the Nazis? Yeah. Yeah. And to build uh, the planes and yeah. 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 Well, Rosie, the liberator, and this wasn't my idea. It's a volunteer named Margot uh, Desterhaus. She had the idea. What if we have men and women sort of look sideways and make yeah. a muscle and make a fist and, you know, it's all to the good if you're wearing this. Right. But 
we want people just to take a snapshot and please don't make it fancy. Just uh, do it with your, with your cell phone yeah. and then post it to social media with the hashtag win this fight. Yeah. All right. That's part one. Part okay. two is encourage your friends to do it and encourage everybody to donate $5 to the anti-trafficking organization of their choice. However, if you don't know of one, uh, donate it to us and we will spread the word. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not terribly about raising funds, but the more funds we have, the more we can do. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think both are important, awareness and funds. So I just want to confirm it's win this fight, not the fight. So nope, I want to make sure everybody gets that. Fight. When, when this, this fight. fight, okay. Making sure that we have that. Yeah. Yep. Just want to make sure we have that. Okay. That sounds good. So, well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I hope that this uh, gets out there, you know, to a lot of people and, you know, and, and of course, uh, you know, when this, when this episode gets published, we'll be po- pushing it out there on social media, like nobody's business. And, um, you know, and I think the awareness is going to start happening. There's a couple of new uh, social media platforms that are becoming really, really popular. And I did notice that there were some uh, topics around human trafficking in those uh, meetings, in those different uh, meetings that were being hold, held. So um, let's just hope that, you know, by God's grace that we are able to, you know, stop this and, and prevent it. And, and I think it's going to have to start grassroots in our local areas and recognizing that it actually exists. Even if, way, in- if they will send yeah, their, their rosy picture yeah. to winthispite.org, they can upload the picture that's and awesome. they can vote on, on other people's pictures because oh, that's cool. you know, some people are artists, some people like decorated their dog. Um, oh yeah. And I probably will do something stupid, you know, like silly and not, and not great, but uh, you know, it's just about doing it. It's about participating and well, it's know, not so watching fun. the game, get in the game. Yeah. And then uh, if, if they go to my website, winthisfight.org, I would love for you to volunteer. And I make a promise to every single person who volunteers that I will do my absolute darndest to give you assignments that don't take more time than, than you want to give and that will use your skills and background so that you'll have a satisfying experience knowing that you're making a difference in people's lives. Beautiful. And so I'd love to have people join. I also would like to, them to sign up for my blog because I think they'll find it fascinating. I interview people like psychiatrists who say, why do the bad guys do it? Yeah. Or, or what are the signs to look for? I mean, I, it's, there are a hundred blog posts and I write a new one every week. That's awesome. And I think I have that link as well. I, I do think I have that link for your blog. Yeah, well. winthisfight.org and, and they'll see the blog and okay. sign up for it. And you're glad you did. That's great. So Mitzi, what do you want to leave us with today? Do you have a quote that you'd like to share with us, you know, as it encapsulates all that we've talked about today um, that you'd like to share with people to inspire them? Yeah, it comes from Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa, you know, she she treated lepers in India. Mm-hmm. And, People said, you know, the problem is just so big, you can't make any difference. She was Sister Teresa at the time. And she, yeah. and here comes the quote. She said, it's immoral to be discouraged by the magnitude of a problem. The good that we can do, we must do. I love that. I love that. You know, and it is so apropos for what we're all experiencing here in the United States right now with all these transitions that we're all experiencing. I mean, there's just so much stuff going on and, and we think, oh, just forget it. I mean, you know, now I do like COVID. I'm just going to go in my, my little hermit crab <laughs> right, shell and I'm just going to forget the whole world. But that's it. You know, it's very apropos is that the only way that we move forward is when we start taking the steps. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for sharing so much with me. And I loved having time with you in the green room and Um, just wonderful to get to know you. What a great story you have to tell. And I love the inspiration. I love the work that you continue to do and what you're giving back to the world. Um, So again, thank you so much for being here today. It's been pure joy. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Okay, everybody, we'll catch you next time. And just as a quick reminder, please write a review and let us know what you think about this episode and other episodes and give us a five-star rating too. I mean, this woman deserves that. (laughs) 
<laughs> she deserves a five star rating for all that she's doing in this world. So um, again, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your day to listen into the inspirational stories that we are bringing to you every single week. And I'll catch you next time. You've been listening to Success to Significance with Jen Duplessis, the number one podcast for people wanting to give more value and make an impact. Loved this episode? Be sure to subscribe right now at www.jenduplessis.com slash S2S for more stories, strategies, and thoughts to help you gain significance and success. And if you like what we're doing, don't forget to give us a rating and review so we can continue to bring you the best content possible. Join us next week for another breakthrough episode. Thank you for listening.